Okay, this is part three of liberal Christians versus conservative Christians. Here we go. I feel misrepresented in that um, I often say that the evangelical or conservative church has built an idol to sexual purity and sexual integrity, which is why the gay issue is so high on the agenda and the pro-choice, pro-life issue. The Bible is not a sex manual. Right. Nor was he harping on social justice. See, this works both ways. And so you've made an idol of social justice. You've made an idol of racism. You've made an idol of pro-LGBTQ. Jesus never once supported gay people. He never once said, it's all good. And so you've made this idol out of supporting something Jesus, it works both ways. The point is, this, this kind of stuff, you can have your opinion. You can say, I think evangelicals, well, I'm an evangelical and I disagree with you. You can say that if you want, I just disagree with you. I do not have an idol out of sexual purity. Jews have always, Christians have always, until about the 1960s, we've always cared about sexual purity because God does. We didn't make this stuff up. We don't make this stuff, we go to authority. We don't say we just have feelings. We pass down our feelings and preferences to our children. We go back to what the text says, and that's, that's a major distinction. If you call going back to the text an idol, boy, do we disagree. I mean, I'm no way around that one. I think a lot of people turn to the progressive side because they're hurt by the church and what the church did to them and how the church treated them. It's showing people come as you are and stay as you are instead of come as you are and let God change you and let God work in you to not live the way you were before but to change and have a new life and become a new creation and join me in heaven. Well, I feel represented. Absolutely concur. I feel misrepresented because, like you said, you think it's about the issues like sexuality or social justice. I feel like because they want to accept, because they want people to know about the love of God, they're mis misrepresenting the love of God. And that's what conservatives care about, the word of God and the gospel. Again, I go back to like the inerrancy of, of scripture, which I see a lot in conservative church. I do not believe the words of Paul are the words of God. And that's definitely where we veer off for a lot of people. That's a okay, okay. Let's delete 13 letters from the New Testament. We're left with Jesus, right? Are you still a Christian? And if you are, then what do you do with Jesus' instruction? What do you do with Jesus' demand that people repent? This is bedrock Jewish, uh, a good, putting Jesus in his Jewish context and reading the text very well, Mark 1:15. What do you do with the demand they told people to repent? What do you do with the fact that he said that humans were made male and female by God, and that if they can't stay married, and that is, on their, they're, they're not people who are victimized in divorce. Those who initiate it. If you, if you're not, look, if you're always looking for a way out, don't get married. What do you mean, Jesus? Then you need to stay a eunuch. The point is, if you're going to go in, stay in all together, male and female together. That Jesus said that. Jesus said that Matthew 19. So do you say Matthew wasn't the word of God? Do you say like that's? But this is progressive Christianity. You just cut out all the parts you don't like, all the parts that don't fit your understanding of Jesus, the parts that might hurt people's feelings. And I don't find that persuasive it's a big thing like we believe that just all scripture including that which paul wrote was inspired by god and so no i believe it's all inspired by god but i don't believe it's literally god the only reason i'm going in on this is to clarify that we love and honor the bible too we really do i read my bible every single day and i think that is the thing that most conservatives don't understand about progressives more than anything well, okay well i'm a conservative i have never thought ever I think progr progressive Christians don't love the Bible. I don't give a rip. I don't care if you love the Bible. I don't care if conservative Christians love the Bible. I don't care if anybody loves the Bible. I care about Jesus, and I care about trying to live a lifestyle according to the teaching of Jesus. Your particular psychological, emotional state toward the Bible is irrelevant. How much you read it is also irrelevant. I, can read, I know people who read it all the time and who do not believe in Jesus. I I've met uh, 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 Muslims and certain Jews who I really appreciate the teaching of Jesus, but they're not Christians. They're not disciples. It's irrelevant if you read it. It's irrelevant if you appreciate it. It's irrelevant if you love it. The issue is, are you accurately representing Jesus? Are you accurately representing the teaching of Jesus in the early church? If you're not, you're sinning and you're leading other people to sin. And Jesus said, it's better to throw a millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the water than cause these little ones to sin. And everybody thinks New Testament scholarship. Little ones doesn't mean little people. He means disciples. 
you can cause another person to sin. And then, of course, he said, yeah, might as well kill yourself. Then call someone to sin because you like these broad, wide roads to destruction. It's easy, and you like that. It's the least amount of resistance. But the hard and narrow pipe is the right way. Let's get that right. Let's get the preaching of the kingdom of God right, not whether or not you like the Bible. It just doesn't matter. Welcome. Our ambiguities of like this and that, and our this is the way you see it. That's an age old thing if you go back and you look. That's why Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses on the um, Catholic Church because he had all of these issues or all of these problems with what they thought religiously and he goes on to start the Lutheran Church. And then like um, my sister said, we read the same Bible. We, I get up and I, re I, I read and study my Bible every week. Progressive Christian. So what? If you don't do what it says, who gives a rip? I mean, I'm, that's for me too. I'm not judging him. I, I read my Bible every day, almost every single day. Well, who gives a rip? I'm going to go out here and lie and steal and cheat. But I love my Bible. I worship my Bible. I read it every day. I get every bit of it memorized. It doesn't matter if you don't do what it says. Christianity is seeing the Christianity that we grew up in and then seeing the problem and then we realize, okay, let's fix it. So we come up with new ideas and new ways to fix it, but based on the scripture that we all grew up reading. When I, when I pastor my church and they're having a hard time understanding the scriptures, I'm gentle with them because they're trying to learn. But I feel I could be harsh with progressive Christians because if, they, if you claim to be a Christian, you should know better. And I believe, especially after this talk, you don't know how to interpret the word. You are dishonoring God because you are not doing his will. Now, I firmly believe that because saying the word of God is not absolute or sovereign. You're saying and you're picking and choosing based on your interpretations. I think your hermeneutics is off. See, the, my church members are trying to learn, but it seems like you already have an agenda and you're trying to fit the Bible into that agenda instead of accepting the gospel for what it is, that without the gospel, people are going to hell. And that's a very serious issue, more serious than sexual orientation or aborted babies. And I think that's the key issue between conservatives and progressives. It's not about the issues, it's about the Word of God. And when you disrespect the Word of God like you are doing, it Like you suppose that we're doing. Because your hermeneutics is wrong. And they can disagree. I understand you, you suppose it. I, I'm with you. I agree you suppose it. This is the difference, though, I would say is the uh, maybe a distinction. I, I, man, I love what he just said, except when he says it's your view of the Word of God. I, this is where I am. Um, I guess that can be very problematic and confusing because it doesn't really matter your view of it. The issue is what's authoritative for moral obligation today. So I think that's what he's trying to get at. But the problem with that is they're, they're not, it's one thing to say I have a high view of Scripture. It's a narrative inspired. I can call all the words I want to use it. I can, I can call it all of that and think those things. It does not follow from that that I do what Jesus says. That does not follow. What I'm saying is when we end up focusing on the first one so much, what to call it is inspired and errant it, whatever we call it, then we're trying to debate what to call it. But in Christianity, it doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is if you live like Jesus and you give your life to Jesus. So is the text authoritative? We can have grounds for thinking it's morally authoritative, even if we don't call it the same thing. So in my view, when I'm talking to non-Christians, I don't even care what they call it. I care whether or not we have reasons to think it's authoritative. And enough of it authoritative. Do we know enough about Jesus and his teaching to think that's authoritative? And my response is absolutely we do for good historical reasons, regardless if you call it inspired, inerrant, word, you can drop all that language, you can still find it authoritative. All I'm saying is we don't need to debate the first one to get to the second one. My view, that's my view. Not necessarily. Though I probably wouldn't have said it as curt, I do believe that the gospel is essential above topics of, and though the church hasn't done a great job with capitalizing on some sins and not really talking about the other, like I know that we mentioned divorce earlier, um, I do think the gospel is of primary importance, and I, I would have to second that, like, my biggest thing is just, like, taking parts of scripture and then not taking the other. Um, but I probably wouldn't have said it as Kurt. But yeah. As an African-American, we... So right, as soon as anybody says that, I know that you're 
what you're about to say is racist. I would never start as a white person. I don't speak for all white people. And I don't assume if you're not white, you can't comprehend what I'm saying. That's racist. That means I think my understanding of my experience is superior than your understanding because of the color of my skin. And that, that's, I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's like Jesus. As a white person, let me tell you how this works. As a white, I, don't, I wouldn't do that. We dealt with slavery. And if you go back and you, you study history, um, and you look at the, the history of black people, we were indoctrinized by the Bible. Slaves obey your masters. And they indoctrinated that into us to, to keep us oppressed. When you talk about literalism when it comes to scripture. This, well, you know, and, and I know this is so common. I'm just, I guess I'm saying I fundamentally disagree. When you say it oppressed us, 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 there's no us, man. You weren't alive, you were never a slave. You were not a slave. I bet your parents weren't slaves. I bet your grandparents weren't slaves. Maybe a great, 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 maybe, okay. But you're not a slave, you never have been a slave. So you've never had a slave owner indoctrinate you whatsoever. You are not part of that. The color of the skin does not mean you have a shared experience. You're an American, you're a gay American, pastoring a church. You're the opposite of being a slave. You're affluent, you have nice clothes, nice haircut. You're not a slave, you've never been a slave. You can't relate to what they go through. Imagine time traveling, and he walks up there looking just like this, and there's Kunta Kinte out in the field, and he goes, man, I get it. Whew, brother, we have been there, haven't we? Man, we, I know exactly what you're going through. Where I come from, sometimes my Starbucks order is not right. I've got to deal with people rolling their eyes. Every, you don't know, we do, they don't know, do they? They don't know how bad we've got it. I imagine him saying that to slave out in the field picking cotton. When it comes to scripture, you have to be very careful because if you because if you do that, then then you open up something that is catastrophic. And I think it's terrible that people I agree, interpreting scripture, you be careful. That's right. I agree. I don't know what he means by catastrophic. My view is based on the text itself, the reason why we should care about what we teach is because of the influence we have on people. That's from the Bible. But Jesus says such a thing, it's also implied in James, that teachers, you shouldn't want to be a teacher, you'll be doubly judged and you have an influence on people all the time. This is all through Judaism and Christianity. We have an influence. And so it's not because it could be catastrophic because it hurts someone's feelings. It could be bad because you lead them to sin. That's a fundamental, so I agree we should be very careful. I bet the reasons why we uh, have that view is very different. I think it's terrible that people took scripture out of context because all man was created in the likeness of God. All men, all men, all people. So when they were quoting verses about slavery, they disregarded what was said in Genesis in the beginning that all people were created in the likeness of God. If all men were created in the image of God, then that, that's gay people, that's transgender people, that's um, African American people, that's Asian people, that's all. You, You're talking you, about race, sexual identity. At first, I'm gonna say I agree with him. That's why I don't go to Genesis to say that's why we shouldn't have slavery. Uh, that's not, anyway, th that's true because that should make the argument. But what he's about to say in response is very good. And this is, I'm glad it's coming from a fellow black person. I'm assuming he's black. Uh, the guy with the glasses is talking. I'm assuming he also can really resonate with all of the slavery he's been through. Like this other gentleman who's there in his nice clothes, but notice he didn't mention slavery and how he understands it and high fives him. And I know what it means. And those are completely different no, things. They're all, they're all I don't, here's the thing, whether I choose to walk outside and identify as being black or not, I got black skin. Whether I choose to identify with behaviors on how I feel is a completely different thing. And that's true with your ancestry. Whether I choose to say I'm part of this long oppressive group of people, or whether I say that was them, that was them, that was their an my ancestors are because of my color of skin. Man, they were, that's true. They went through some horrible, and they did go through horrible, horrible, wretched slavery. It was horrible slavery. In the, uh, and the modern conception, it was very horrible. And that's, I'm being very specific, very horrible. But you can choose to identify that or say, no, but I'm not them, I didn't go through that. Look at my life. I'm affluent and educated and articulate. I've got jobs and no one's trying to hang me on trees right now. I mean, I, it's horrible what they went through, but the color of my skin doesn't mean I'm like them. I've gone through the same experience or that I can speak on their behalf. 
I can't speak on their behalf. They can't speak on my behalf. Why? Because I'm an individual. I'm not a representative of a group because of the color of my skin. And he's saying the same thing. I'm, I'm black as black, whatever I identify as, but it's different when it comes to this. Well, that's when you go into a lifestyle and orientation and, and that's an argument within itself. There is a danger, I agree, in, in interpreting scripture literally because it can be so easily weaponized against people. Inter now back to literal, I wouldn't say the word literal, ever, 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 literal. And I, I know the meaning of it, but in modern parlance, literal was very problematic for people. So I would just drop that and say whether it's morally, you might not say the word morally obligatory like I do because I'm a nerd. You might say, do Christians have to obey that now? Okay, do Christians have to obey that now? That's the question, not whether it's literal. Interracial marriage was illegal in this country until 1967. And there were Christian women protesting because white Christians thought it was unbiblical and it was in the Bible, it was clear that we're not supposed to be mixing with other races. I can't say you're going which is again a fantastic example of why it is irrelevant what the Christians protested. It doesn't matter what they felt. It doesn't matter what their intuitions told them. It doesn't matter what their passions were. Just like it doesn't matter what her passions are. It doesn't matter what she believes. It doesn't matter what she feels. It doesn't matter. If a person supports the enslavement of a person by beating them, then they're wrong. Because why the New Testament says don't do that? I've gone for a long time about that. They did not. The early Christians did not support slavery whatsoever. They did not. Paul treats slaves, he tells the owners to treat them as brothers, not as slaves. It is, it's an egregious sin in 1 Timothy, those who are kidnappers. They steal people to slavery. The early Christian movement did not. The fact that later on Christians kept using the scriptures out of context to support slavery were wrong. Jesus would not have supported beating up people to work out in the fields all day long. It doesn't matter what Christians have done. It matters what Jesus taught and what the early church taught. But see, now we're back to authority again. Whether or not they felt it is irrelevant. Whether what Jesus said in early church is another thing. They are going to hell. I can't say that because I don't know her relationship know. with God. And I can't say the same for you or you. And even between us as conservative Christians, mm -hmm. we identify in different belief systems. I think just this world is not our home. Our focus is on making it to heaven and doing what we can to get there and making sure that we're reaching people along the way. The church does need to do a better job of reaching people in a respectful, caring, loving way, not just throwing scripture down someone's throat or not just throwing standards or what they think is right, but what Jesus showed us to live by loving our neighbor as ourselves and to make connections with people and truly care about the person and the soul because this life is just temporary. And I appreciate that. I wouldn't say it the same. I, I, I appreciate that very much. So I also have an immediate kind of allergic reaction to people who say the church doesn't. The church. When you say the church doesn't or the church does, you need to be an historian or maybe, a, well, yeah, either an ancient or a modern historian, and you can have facts or data to support what the church believes, because you're speaking for over two billion people. And even then, no one thinks you're speaking on behalf of all Christians at all places. So that's a very, just cautious. It's one thing to say Christian literature says this, or Jewish literature makes this point. You can, historians, we do that all the time. We can say, for example, for example, in every single piece of Jewish literature and Christian literature, for at least 3,000 years in Judaism, close to 2,000 years in Christianity, every single time sexuality is mentioned, it always abhors or rejects any kind of sexual morality, any kind of sexual moral, immorality with animals, with siblings, with relatives, uh, and with same sex. It only supports separate sex, uh, so heterosexual marriage. So the text says that what every single Christian, individual Christian has believed, we don't know what they've individually believed, that's a lot of people. We can say the text has said this. So that's why I get, prob today it's problematic when I hear, well, I think the church could do a better job. I, I mean, I'd say, say, who are you? Or why not just say, maybe you can do a better job. Maybe you can say the, the local church of which I'm a part, we can do a better job. But the church is, so when I hear these things, someone says, I think the church can do it. I think, well, I am. I am. I do love people. I do. When the guy said earlier, the church has not done a good job. We've elevated certain sins. Well, certain churches might do that. I don't do that. And I'm the senior pastor of a church. I don't ever go around going, these sins are the worst. These are better and hammering that. I've been, I've heard 
teachers do that, but that doesn't mean the church is doing that. You're talking about for do, two billion people. But I think people do that because it helps them feel better. It's a way of saying, I'm so sorry, non-Christian. I know, I know we have failed you. And I appreciate that mentality that we're trying to be apologetic. I mean, we're trying to be humble. I appreciate that. I just like to be accurate. And instead of saying the church has, I wouldn't do that. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you'll share this with your friends and comment and tell your neighbors and friends everything about it. I hope as Christians I learn a lot. I'll see you online.